we know what the problem is. We know that the problem is that we live in this time of mental distraction and this uh, the so-called attention economy with so many entities, you know, trying to get you to look in their uh, direction. It's a war for your attention. And it bleeds over into affecting curiosity because I think it makes us ultimately more um, passive and gives us this sense of, you know, we constantly, instead of pursuing our own curiosities, we're worried about being up on what everyone else is talking about. Hence the idea that there's now always a set on every news site, there's a section now of most popular news, which is a sort of a astonishing comment. Uh, and most of the time what we're missing out on is, uh, you know, nothing. So the most recent statistic I, that relates to curiosity that I came across on this is a Wall Street Journal piece about the TikTok algorithm. And it uh, pointed out that 75% of YouTube views are of videos served up by the algorithm, which is a very passive way to take in uh, uh, content or media. And it's even higher with uh, TikTok. Um, and this is what we're sort of trying to buck up against by uh, trying to be more curious and more actively curious. Um, probably some of you know Jenny O'Dell and her book, uh, How to Do Nothing. Mm. She has some good observations about curiosity as something that you know she correctly, I think, associates it with childhood, but also with it being a forward driving force that's about the difference between what you know and what you don't know. And it assumes that there's something you haven't seen that you'd like to see, something, always something around the corner. So you could think of the woman in that video we just watched as being someone who's definitely, you know, there's something she hasn't seen that she'd like to see. <laughs> she thinks there's something around the corner. But you can also see paradoxically how you know, things like TikTok feed into that and they feel like you're satisfying your curiosity because there's always one more video, there's always one more clip, there's always one more swipe that you can make. And that's what I'm, you know, I'm not out to demonize technology and that's never a theme of mine, but I am out to try to make a case for curiosity as something to be more actively participating in. And here's the funny thing is that the truth is, no one's against me on this. No one, I don't really need to convince you that curiosity is important. With this uh, scholar, uh, uh, Francesca Gino, who's done some interesting work on this and what she has found in say workplace situations that everyone agrees, curiosity triggers creative solutions. Curious workers interact more with their colleagues. Curious people build more diverse networks, which is a good thing for uh, business. Curious workers are more empathetic. They're willing to put themselves into other people's shoes and take an interest in others' ideas. Um, this uh, person, Francesca Gino, did a, a survey and found that 92% of workers credit curious colleagues with innovative ideas and uh, viewed curiosity as a catalyst for job satisfaction, motivation, innovation, and high performance. So she's at the Harvard Business School and did some of this work uh, over the last few years. And there are any number of anecdotal uh, examples of innovation coming through curiosity. Georges de Mestral got curious about why burrs were sticking to his pants and that led to the um, invention ultimately of Velcro. Um, a woman named Mary Anderson, another one of my favorite examples in the early 1900s on a visit to New York was struck by how trolley cars were having trouble keeping in the winter, were having trouble keeping frost off the windows. And everyone in New York at the time just sort of took it for granted, like, yeah, that's a problem. That's just how it is. Anyway, her questioning, her curiosity, her asking why led to her holding the patent for the uh, windshield wiper. And then finally, just another quick one is that uh, the Polaroid, the, the Edwin, the Polaroid instant camera was essentially inspired by Edward, Edward Land's daughter, a three-year-old, who just wanted to know why she had to wait to see the picture that was being taken with a camera before the age of instant cameras. So 
we all kind of agree curiosity is a great thing, but uh, I have been struck by a couple of years ago coming across this um, thing in the Harvard Business Review that there was this gap between um, what executives thought they were communicating and what people in the rank and file were hearing. And Francesca Gino has um, also studied this and in a survey that she did separate from what we're looking at here, conducted of more than 3000 employees from a wide range of firms and industries, only about 24% reported feeling curious in their jobs on a regular basis. And about 70% said they actually face barriers to asking more questions at work, a cornerstone of curiosity. So I've been very puzzled by this and sort of trying to pursue it. And I've started to think of it as the curiosity paradox because why would this be? Why would there be this kind of universal uh, feeling that curiosity is an important thing and a lack of you know, acting and paying off of that in the actual workplace? And I should just do as an aside, I know I'm talking a lot about organizational contexts and Everything I'm saying, I think, is just as true on an individual level. I know a lot of you who are art of noticing readers are creators on a sort of independent level. But I think that the same things apply where you feel that curiosity is important, but it doesn't always necessarily feel like the culture is pushing you in that direction and rewarding your, your curiosity. So Ezra Klein has been recently talking about the product, what he calls the productivity paradox, which is the uh, basically in a nutshell, the idea that we do a lot of things at work that sort of look like they're accomplishing things, but they're really not. And I think the curiosity paradox is the flip side of that. I think we have a very difficult time measuring the payoff of curiosity. So therefore it doesn't get kind of pushed and rewarded. And I have a couple of reactions to this. One is, you know, who cares of whether you're being um, encouraged or, or prodded to be curious. You don't need, I'll give you right now permission to be curious. You don't need, you don't need your boss to uh, tell you to be curious or your company to tell you to be curious. Um, but that's clearly not enough. And so I'm making a case for curiosity, which is what I've been doing for the last uh, 10 minutes or so. And I'll have a couple more points to make before I get, um, to the main thing that I'm gonna do with you today, which is uh, I have 10 curious prompts uh, to uh, give you something that you can walk away with to try to uh, hopefully boost your curiosity or, 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 or give, you some more, give you some more reasons to be satisfied with being uh, curious. Um, Normally when I do any kind of um, talk or workshop like this, it's for a little bit more of a defined group with a specific set of concerns. Uh, and today is a little more wide ranging, which I'm excited about. Um, but because you're a, few, you're, you're a diverse bunch, but you're also a self-selecting bunch and that you are curious people or you wouldn't be here right now. Uh, you have found your way to the newsletter. You found your way to me. You found your way to this event. Um, you're a curious, uh, you're a pro-curious person. So I want to try to zero in on offering some ideas for you that will uh, basically try to leverage two aspects of curiosity. There's a scholar, Todd Cashton at George Mason University who's kind of the leading guy on curiosity and his colleagues, and they've identified these various dimensions of curiosity. The two that I'm really focused on and this is just something to have in the back of your mind, or joyous explanation and what, and, and what they call social curiosity, which I think is important. Um, and I'm gonna talk about uh, more. Um, yeah. And the way that I'm summarizing these, big picture, broadly speaking, what would happen if, and that was what we saw with our uh, hero in that video, uh, you know, she asked what would happen if I actually stepped on this. Um, <laughs> and we now know the answer is that there's, um, there's a payoff sometimes to asking that. And then the other, the other big overarching question is just why? The question that Edwin Land's uh, three-year-old daughter asked about why, you know, uh, ch children are terrific at asking these kind of annoying 
why questions that like, well, everybody knows that blah, 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 blah. Children don't accept what everybody knows. They're constantly asking why. But the other dimension to this that is um, very recent for me in my thinking about this, uh, and I mean recent within like, this is stuff, some stuff that came up kind of after I announced this talk. So I wasn't planning to talk about this at all, but I think it's pretty important. Um, is that curiosity is about openness and about childlike wonder and about how children don't worry about whether others believe they should already know the answers and a sort of fearlessness about, you know, not wanting to look dumb. But I realized recently that talking about curiosity that way makes it sound like an extra, like an add-on, like a luxury. Like once you've got everything else taken care of, then you can put aside some time to be curious. And I don't think that's true anymore. I had a couple of things come up and they're, <laughs> they're all a result of this uh, Ted Lasso. I'm sure many of you watch this show. I am actually, I have never seen it. I've only seen clips online. So I'm not an expert on the show itself, but I am an expert on how much people are constantly talking about this show right now. And in particular, this uh, moment where he talks about being curious and not judgmental. Um, there was a post by the blogger, Jason Kotke, who uh, picked up on this and talked about, I'll just read you what he said. I recently had a falling out with someone I care about in part because I paid insufficient attention to who they were as a person. I was ignorant and incurious in our relationship, a disastrous combination that caused deep pain. So this became something I was like, I was just really interested to hear curiosity framed this way as something that's uh, not, not just sort of an adventurous thing, but a vital thing, being curious about who you are dealing with and about them. And uh, so this is the actor who plays Ted Lasso. And this turns out is a key part of this character, the ignorant guy who's actually curious, who's not afraid to ask the dumb questions. But more than that, who's not afraid to uh, recognize how important that is to the basic functioning of relationships both personal relationships as Jason Kaki was talking about, but also Austin Kleon, friend of the newsletter um, and one of the heroes of the Art of Noticing uh, project. Um, just recently talked about this too in a professional context. He said, I'm currently at the tail end of one of the worst projects I've ever been involved in and several failures, failure points probably could have been avoided if I'd had the guts to stick my nose in where it didn't belong and ask the contractors stupid questions until I was satisfied with their answers. This is a whole other way of thinking about curiosity. Um, curiosity as not just a joyous exploration tactic, but as a basic tactic for functioning in a creative, productive way on almost any level, uh, professional, personal, or otherwise. And so this, I kind of got excited about thinking about that. I mean, it sounds a little like a drag, but it's, uh, I got excited about it because I think we're at this moment where this is a good topic for companies in particular to be thinking about. This is a moment when the workforce is stressed out, looking for change and you know, what can you do to help them? But people are also open to change right now, I think in an unprecedented way. And there are opportunities to make the most of that. So that's my case for curiosity. Those of you who read the newsletter, which I'm going to assume is most of you, will not be surprised to know that what I'm going to transition to now is a series of prompts. I love prompts. It is the way that I have uh, built the book and the newsletter as provocations and just a way of framing things so that I'm not just saying, here's an interesting point, but saying, here's something you can do. Um, normally when I do this kind of workshop thing, it's, 
in a smaller group on a finite amount of time. And I give people like, well, let's take an hour and do this, or I'll give you this and we'll do it in a week. This is a little more open-ended. Um, I'm only gonna, but I do have one thing that I, assignment that I'm, I, I wanna actually, if I can convince you to do it, I, 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 I would like you to actually do it right now, which is uh, spend, hopefully all of you are somewhere near a window or most of you are near a window. And I would love it if you could take the next 30 seconds and just go look out the window. And the only narrowing prompt I'll give you around that is uh, pay attention to uh, what's natural and what's man-made or human-made in what you see out your window. This is from a site called windowswap.com. This is Perth, Australia. This is somewhere in North Carolina. This is uh, Portugal, Sweden. It's a fun site. Uh, and this is uh, my window in uh, New Orleans. So just take 30 seconds and look out your window and ponder the natural versus the, the non-natural. Take notes if you if you if you can, because we're going to come back to this. Okay, so like I said, normally I um, do these in a way where we regather after the end of the thing, and but we're not going to be able to do that because we're doing this online. But if you take pictures or do anything for any of the assignments that I talk about for the next uh, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, um, feel free to post them. Uh, I, it took me a while to finally find a hashtag that wasn't in, your, in use. So uh, how curious 2021. And I will look for that on Instagram and Twitter and um, SoundCloud as I'll get to and uh, highlight stuff in the newsletter. Um, but all you're looking for right now is like, think about looking that exercise of looking at the window and what you noticed before, probably it's a window that you have been, had proximity to for a long time. What did you notice that you had never noticed before? And we'll come back to it. All right. And then here are some other prompts that you can do over, like, let's say the next week. Give a very specific award. Here's my example of this. This is a street artist named Michael Peterson, who is uh, Australian. And here is a typical scene that he uh, kind of works in. And it doesn't really look like anything. There's just a, some sort of uh, neglected building and some tall weeds. And, but what is that plaque and an award? Ah, he's given the Urban Weed Award for the tallest weed. So give an award, that's one prompt. Take a sound shot. As those of you who read the newsletter know, I'm a big fan of um, the audio form of noticing and attention. And I think that this plays well with curiosity. I define a sound shot as being equivalent to a snapshot. And in this case, I, I define it as just use it a one minute recording with your voice memo app on uh, your phone. Um, and my friend, Mark Wiedenbaum, happy birthday, Mark, if you are uh, on this call, I have no idea, um, teaches a class where he has his students make uh, audio sound maps. And this is a good uh, framing device you can use for taking sound shots. So think about what are the most important sounds in your neighborhood or the neighborhood where your office is or some new place you're exploring. I think it's really important with um, attention and curiosity to get outside the visual. So I always include this kind of prompt close to the top of the talk because I think that we really, really, and I'm guilty of this too, get into the rut of just thinking about the visual and the more you can open up your senses, the more you will discover and be surprised. 
And again, if you want to upload clips to SoundCloud, um, I'll search for them. Okay, this is a big one when it comes to curiosity, is to could be. Mm. And the way I often frame it is to use examples from the world of street art, because street artists are really good at looking at the environment and seeing things that aren't there. I talk about this a little bit as notification in the newsletter of sort of a speculative way of looking, which I think really rhymes well with curiosity. So in this case, you see these things. Okay, this guy, Tom Bob, uh, is just terrific. And that Tom Bob NYC on Instagram, uh, highly recommend, just a brilliant at um, spotting things and turning them into these delightful tableaus. Uh, I don't know to what extent he works with getting permission. And uh, same thing with a lot of these street artists. So I am not uh, advocating you going out and committing acts of uh, vandalism. I am advocating this way of uh, looking at the world as a creative form of looking that is driven by and that sort of feeds uh, curiosity. And some of these I've shared in the newsletter and some of them not. And in some cases I know the artists and I'm trying to give artist names where I know them. Um, <laughs> and then I like these variations that are kind of street art adjacent. Um, you know, it's a creative way of looking. Don't know the story with this, but I think it's hilarious. And of course, yeah. But this is a way of looking, this way of expressing curiosity and pursuing curiosity. There's a designer I know who calls himself Rotten Apple, who's very good at this, who works entirely on the street and does things like convert a bicycle rack into a chair, uh, fire hydrant into a chess table playing uh, tableau, and then sometimes doesn't even add anything to the environment, just notices, uh, finds, uh, something like here's a uh, walk don't walk sign and just here put this instruction and suddenly it's converted into a way to exercise. The prompt to make it art is can also be thought of as simply looking for things that are out of place. But a terrific example, Stefan Draschen does a lot of work in museums. Uh, he has a series of photographs of people touching paintings, for example. <laughs> uh, but my favorite series that he does is people who have fallen asleep in museums. So I love the idea that these people who are, this is what you're not supposed to look at when you're at the museum. You're not supposed to be looking at people who have nodded off. They're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. But I would argue that this is the more creative way to take in uh, a museum. <laughs> OK. Zoom out and see connections. So back to this window. So one of my weaknesses as a curious person is that I am heavily oriented toward the built environment and away from the natural environment. It is a real challenge for me to get interested in the natural environment. So I have been making an effort when I look out my window to pay more attention to the natural world. So in this case, I noticed that these uh, flowers have grown high enough that it didn't used to be there that I can see them. Uh, they are, so I asked my wife who knows about these things. She said, tells me they are Mexican petunias. And this uh, made me realize that I was participating in bioregionalism, which is, I mentioned Jenny O'Dell earlier. This is one of her big ideas in, or most, most interesting ideas, I think, in How to Do Nothing, is this idea of connecting with, recognizing and attending to what connects you to a specific place. And in this case, um, I live in New Orleans. Uh, Mexican petunias came up into this country from South America and the Caribbean and really only thrive in sort of semi-tropical 
environments like the one that I live in. And Odell's point is that the natural world is our last common meeting ground of agreed upon facts. Um, and I find that compelling. And she sees that as a kind of response to the over uh, technical attention economy that we talked about at the very beginning. This is kind of a remedy from her point of view for that. I would agree with that, but I would also say that it is a great frame for curiosity, whether you are, and you may be the exact opposite of me, um, whether you are more oriented toward the natural or the non-natural world. That's why I think that's an interesting kind of dichotomy to look at when you just literally look out your window and tell yourself or ask yourself, which of those two worlds are you more attuned to and why? And is there something you could learn from paying more attention to the other? And where will that curiosity lead you? Now this, I almost took this out because there's 150 some of you here now, so we can't do this. But um, it, when I'm doing this in groups of smaller groups and I can divide people into groups of five or something, this is a very fun and interesting way of expressing curiosity that can be productive which is just like, let's say you get a group of 10 people together. You could try this with maybe if you are working in an office with a team of 10 people, uh, get everyone together, spend five minutes and find three things that you all have in common. Uh, we're all from the United States or we're all pizza fans or we're all, uh, we all hate the Dallas Cowboys or whatever, uh, uh, just random things coming to mind. Um, and that becomes your group autobiography. Obviously you can tweak these numbers, but this is a good way of safely and freely being curious about each other, which I think can lead to fun and interesting. I've had great results with this uh, and it can be done very much on the fly. It can be done with people who are meeting, meeting each other for the first time, or it can be done with people who are longtime colleagues. Another one that is a good example of active curiosity and that helps connect with other people and that you can play out. I'm a little, you know, I know that we're back in a weird moment with the pandemic and maybe you're not in strange rooms anymore or deciding not to do that. Um, but uh, something that just never fails in almost any situation where you're in a, a, a friend's house, an office, uh, a business, is to just spot the weirdest thing in the room and ask about it. Always there is stuff that's on the mantle in your friend's house that it's obvious why it's there. It's a beautiful vase, it's a trophy, it's something like that. But always there's something bizarre. I know my friend and colleague, Josh Glenn is on this call. We have a project that we have done together for years called um, Project Object that is totally devoted to this idea that, that the weirdest thing in the room is gonna get you the best story. This is an example I picked almost at random. Uh, one of our contributors, uh, Kevin Brockmeyer, uh, has this Wendy's toy. And it came from when he was in high school and he went on a date with, uh, I think it, may, may, it might've been his first date. And he and this young lady went to Wendy's and then to the movies and they got this toy for free at the Wendy's and he thought it would be a fun romantic thing to run it through her hair which was a disastrous idea as they spent the rest of the evening disentangling it and there was no second date. Um, it doesn't have to be something that th th these kinds of things can uh, 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 be a way of connecting even with strangers in certain situations where you can just sort of find a way to low key engage with somebody. This sounds like I'm being negative to find something to complain about but I'm a big fan of complaining. I think it gets a bad rap. Um, with the caveat that I agree with LCD sound system that the best way to complain is to make things. Uh, the important thing about this is to look for things that could be fixed and to do it on your own terms. As my friend Seth Godin says, if I think it's broken, it's broken and you get to say the same thing. 
the point there being that you're not looking for what everyone else is already complaining about. You're looking for things that everyone else is not paying attention to, trying to be curious. Um, I did a post on the newsletter about uh, pothole uh, inspired art and activism. Um, this uh, clockwise from the upper left, Jim Backer, I believe is how it's pronounced in Chicago, does these, uh, identifies potholes and fills them in with these beautiful tiles. Then there are a couple of pothole gardeners. And that one on the lower right is a giant uh, a traffic cone that was made by someone here in New Orleans. There's tons of terrible potholes in New Orleans. And there's just a whole culture of bizarre jokes and, and comical gags. This is something I came across on the street the other day. Someone has marked a pothole with this um, toy car. Uh, the idea though, and someone sent me this recently, uh, this is a French artist who does similar work with broken tiles. But the point being to identify a problem and use creative ways, curious ways of looking to address them. This is a project, I'll do this really quick. I don't, I have never really talked about this for years, but it's a gerrymandering project that I was involved in, underwritten by the uh, Awesome Foundation where we took the idea of the original gerrymander cartoon, which was, you know, creatively complaining about these bizarre districts that were being drawn in ways that just don't make any sense. And I asked a number of illustrators to riff on actual unlikely districts. And here's one in North Carolina. And it was interesting to see how the different illustrators addressed this idea. Steve Brodner did several versions of this. And now that's kind of a downer looking note there. So let's end on, let's make the final uh, example, taking a gratitude photo. Um, a gratitude photo is basically just making an effort to notice their surroundings or show appreciation for the people, places or things that make you happy. And I think this is a time, good time to do this. Um, a study, this was in the New York Times, found that mindful photography can be an easy way to savor the everyday. There's a lot of advice to give, uh, to do gratitude diaries. And some people just aren't into that. And the idea of a mindful, gracious photo just spending a week, maybe once a day, taking a picture of something that you really appreciate. Don't go overboard um, because it sort of dilutes the payoff, but um, make the one decision and make it count. And as with noticing, curiosity comes down to paying attention to what matters to you. And learning to appreciate it or learning to see what needs to be fixed. So notice what you notice, be this person. <laughs> um, and once we're done, I'm gonna open it up to questions here in a second. But once we're done, I hope that I can get you to uh, look out your window again. But this time with some different questions. Uh, what you hear, what puzzles you, what deserves an award, what are you ignorant of? Think about those bioregional clues. Think about what you missed when you looked before, just 30 minutes ago. What are you seeing now that you didn't see then? And then most importantly, the big questions, the big two questions that curiosity raises are what would you change? And what are you grateful for? And I really think this stuff matters because you know we started out at the top talking about the basic problem of all these things fighting for your attention. And uh, I deal with this with my students all the time that they sometimes feel that the issues that they're curious about or want to pay attention to 
they aren't the trending topics. So it seems like they aren't that important or they feel like it's not that important. And I think that's the most important stuff that you can pay attention to. I think that both that sense of joyous curiosity that we saw in the video um, can activate and like needs to happen to activate exciting things and exciting change. But also that the failure to ask questions, to be curious, leads in the opposite direction and leads into just a sort of boring cycle of no innovation whatsoever. And I mean innovation defined as broadly as you can, both on a personal level and on a creative level and on a business level. So uh, that's it. I uh, am excited to take any questions that you would have. Um, you probably already know about the newsletter, but if not, robwalker.substack.com, please subscribe. If you do any of these exercises and want to share your results, then please tag them at uh, How Curious 2021. And like I said, I will be on the lookout for those and highlight anything interesting that comes up in the newsletter. And with that, I will stop sharing. And thank you all for coming.